So these are the numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And uh, as you can see, everyone wanted to have unique symbol for all large numbers and small numbers. Indians were really fond of large numbers more because of their interest in astronomy. Now then, uh, they, the Hindu mathematicians, they created zero, the number zero, and they used 10 digits, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, to write any number, and however large that number may be. Here there is some controversy about the number zero. All of us know that zero was discovered by Indian mathematicians, but somehow uh, foreigners really, they tend to disagree. They say that it is, uh, it is, it was really discovered in uh, Central America under the Maya civilization. So there is little controversy about the concept of zero, whether it was discovered by Indian mathematicians or by foreign mathematicians. But most of the people believe that it was actually an Indian contribution. And now look at the original, look at the uh, invention by, created by Indian mathematicians, which is really the most wonderful part. Hindu mathematicians, they created 10, 20, 30, etc., and they wrote numbers like, for example, 27. They saw 27 as 20 plus 7. They saw 213 as 200 plus 10 plus 3. They saw 3,675 as 3,000 plus 600 plus 70 plus 5. And actually, this is here, the idea of place value is very important. If you consider the number 3675, then if you look at the number 3, which is occurring here, then the place value of 3 is 3,000. Place value of 6 is 600. Place value of 7 is 70. And place value of 5 is only 5. This is the idea of place value, which was really originally invented by Indians. And it's such an important idea that you take any large number, any large number, that can be written very nicely using these place values. For example, 27, you write only 2 and 7, that is 27. And if the Romans have to write it, they will write like this, 10, 10, and then V, and then double I. 213, we will write only 213, and it will be that big number. But the Romans will like it as CCX triple I, where C stands for 100. Similarly, 3,675, we will write like, as I have written here, but the Romans will have to write like this, M, 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 and so on, using all sorts of things like M stands for 1,000, these runs are 500. So from this you can see that if you have a large number, it is very easy to write using a place value system that large number. And if you want to write the same large number using Roman symbols, then you'll be in trouble. That will be very complicated. So that actually tells you the beauty of the place value system which was discovered by Indian mathematicians. And this was actually one discovery for which the whole world is indebted to Hindu mathematicians. You can also write these small numbers, like, for example, 1 by 10, you write as 0.1, 1 by 100 as 0 0.01, and so on. And now, if you have this number, a very complicated number, like uh, 4,62,371.4275, this number, and this number actually is this number using the place value. But if you have to, now imagine, if you have to write this number using Roman symbols, then how complicated that is going to be. You will not be able to write down this number. So here the point separates the whole number with by fractions. This is what is known as the decimal system of writing any rational numbers using the place value and 10 digits only. So the uh, discovery of place value by Indian mathematicians is a very, very nice discovery and the whole world is indebted to this. And this is not that Indians are saying. Here is a mathematician, as you know, this is the great Laplace. And what he wrote is really remarkable. He wrote that how grateful we should be to Hindus who found great decimal system which does not occur to the minds of such almighty mighty mathematicians as Meeting setting and holiness. Sorry? Did you say something? No. No, no, no. Hello? No. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Okay. So this is how Laplace praised the discovery by Indian mathematicians, the discovery of place value system and the decimal system. But something also is very interesting. 
Uh, nowadays, of course, we all know that you take any positive integer n, that can be written as the sum of powers of n. Any positive integer can be written as sum of powers of n. For example, if you take 2, then any number can be written as a power of 2. There is no For example, 58.5625, this number, this number can be written as power of 2 as follows. Namely, you, we, you break this as 2 plus 8 plus 16 plus 32 plus 0.5 and plus 0 0.0625. And these are exactly 2 plus 2 to the power 3 plus 2 to the power 4 and so on. In other words, any number, whatever that number is, whether it is a large number or a small number, it can be written using powers of 2. And therefore, if you want only to use two digits, 0 and 1, then the same number can be written in this form, 111001.1.001. And this is what is known as the binary system of representing area number. And you'll be surprised to know that this binary system of real numbers was discovered by Niels. Of course, its importance was not known at that time. It became very important when computers came. Because as you know, in computers, we use only two symbols, 0 and 1, and we can write any number. So the binary system was discovered by Indian mathematicians. This is a great discovery by Indians. In binary, we use only two digits, 0 and 1. And similarly, you can have ternary representation of number, then you will use three digits, 0, 1, and 2, and so on. You can write, actually, use any number. But the decimal representation, where you use 10 digits, that is the most powerful number that we are using. Now, in fact, the, uh, that every number can be written using only two symbols. This was really uh, discovered by a mathematician called Pingla. And he discovered these numbers in 300 and 500 BC. And I remember this was discovered much before the decimal system was discovered. So it goes to the credit of in the Indian mathematicians that not only they discovered decimal system, they also discovered the binary representation of number, which is so useful in computer science nowadays. It is remarkable, it's remarkable use in computer science was fully realized only in the 20th century, after the computers became popular among the human being. Some people give credit of developing binary arithmetic to Chinese mathematicians, but it was really conceived and used by Indians much before that. The reason it did not go outside was simply because it was done in Sanskrit language, and there were not much travelers that they could take it to other countries. <clears throat> now then comes to the golden period of the uh, Indian mathematics. Indian mathematics and astronomy, and this is called classical period. This is usually uh, between 480 and 1280. And the greatest mathematician of this period is Aryabhat. And he wrote a book called Aryabhatiya. I must tell you that nowadays, of course, whenever we mathematicians are doing research and whenever we get a result, we publish it in a journal. Nowadays, there are so many journals worldwide. At that time, there was nothing like journal. So everybody who used to discover original things, they used to write in the form of a book, mostly in the form of a book. So Aryabhat wrote all of his discoveries in his book called Aryabhatiya, which he wrote at, at the age of only 23. And it is believed that he lived during this period, 476 to 550 AD, and wrote immensely on astronomy and mathematics in Sanskrit slokas. Astronomy is mostly due to Aryabhat. He worked on extracting the square root. You know, at that time, these things were not known, but he, he did all these things. He worked on extracting the square root, cube root, progressions, geometrical problems, quadratic equations, and even solutions of indeterminate equations of degree one. And here, I must tell you that when he was uh, working, he was solving the indeterminate equations of degree one. He developed a method, and that method is known as Kuttak method, and it became very popular even at later mathematician. You know, in mathematics, you have to discover results. Results are important, theorems are important. But even the, the methods are also very important. In other words, what kind of method you, you use to solve a problem? And uh, Aryabhat discovered many methods, and one of the methods was Kuttak method, which became very popular. His works on approximation of pi and on sine functions are really remarkable. I'm not going in detail about these two approximations that he had, but he worked really in a very remarkable manner. He got the approximation of pi and also uh, 
calculated the sine functions, values of sine functions. Now I want to only consider this equation, and this is very important. Consider a linear equation, ax plus by is equal to c, where a, b, c are integers. And uh, here x and y are unknowns, but we want to find that the values of x and y only in integers. In other words, what are the integer values of x and y so that this equation is satisfied for a given set of values a, b, c. And this was known as indeterminate equation. And Aryabhat worked on this indeterminate equation, and he actually solved it. His Kotak method can be used to find the greatest common divisor of A and B, and essentially gives an algorithm to find the same. This was his most original contribution of Aryabhat. You know, algorithm, the concept of algorithm is nowadays so popular in computer science, but he, uh, he gave the idea of algorithm at that time. Actually, in fact, his method can be used to find an integer which, when divided by A and B, leaves remainders R1 and R2. This is a very simple problem in arithmetic, but he, his method can be used to find, solve this problem. And not only that, actually, this can be generalized. A generalization of this gives the theorem, which is nowadays known as the Chinese remainder theorem, committed to all the time. And a very powerful theorem. But I must tell you that Aryabhat already had this Chinese remainder theorem. The Chinese remainder theorem is due to Indian mathematician, but somehow it is now known as only a Chinese remainder theorem. So those were the contributions of Aryabhat, and now I come to the contribution of Brahmagup, a very important, very great mathematician after Aryabhat. The second most important mathematician after Aryabhat was Brahmagup, and he was born in 598 AD, and he wrote again a famous book, and it is known as Brahm Sutta Siddhanta at the age of 30, and all of his discoveries are contained in this book. Now here there is something very important I must tell you. Brahm Gupt, he became interested in solving an equation like this, x squared minus n times y squared is equal to k. He considered this equation, where n and k are given integers, and x and y are indeterminates to, to be found out among integers. So the problem that he posed was that given an integer n and given an integer k, find out all those integers x and y so that x squared minus n times y squared is equal to k. And he actually, if you start, if you take any value of n and k and you start solving this equation, actually you will have a lot of difficulty. It is not easy. And if you want to try, uh, try and see how difficult it is. Now, but then he developed a method. Again, it's very important that he developed the method. And that method was such that if you can have one solution of this equation, then using his method, you can prove that it has infinite number of solutions. And this is what nowadays we mathematicians do. In other words, if you know one solution, can you find out a second solution, third solution? Can you find out infinite number of solutions? And he developed the method Bhavana. And Bhavana is a very important method, even nowadays it is used. And using that method, he proved that if you have one solution of this equation, you have actually infinite number of solutions. And he solved these equations in two special cases. I want to tell you, one is this equation, x squared minus 92y squared is equal to 1, and he found this solution, x is equal to 1151, y is equal to 120. You can see that this satisfies this equation. And the second equation was, x squared minus 83 by y squared equal to 1. And the solution is 82, 9. He solved this. He solved using his method. But then it is very surprising that he could not solve this general equation, namely x squared minus n times y squared equal to 1. He fixed k is equal to 1. And uh, given any n, he could not solve this general equation. So actually a great problem remained, which he could not do, Brahmagupta could not do. His method could not be used to solve this problem. And now, here is something historical you might will be interested to know, that he, he left this problem as unsolved, and this problem was again attacked by this man, Fermo, the great mathematician. As you know, Fermo was the greatest number theorist in the history of mankind. So he considered this equation, namely x squared minus n times y squared is equal to 1. Now notice, that what Brahmagupta had considered that equation, he left that equation. The same equation was considered by uh, 
Pharma, and uh, he could not solve this equation. He sent it to Euler, the second mathematician, and uh, somehow Euler became interested in this equation, and he named it as Pell's equation. And it became very famous as Pell's equation. So it is very surprising that this equation was really originally discovered by Brahmagupta, but nobody knows that it is Brahmagupta's equation. It became Pell's equation because Euler uh, named it as a Pell, Pell equation. Pell, Pell was actually a British mathematician who had nothing to do with this equation. So this is where actually the whatever was done by Indian mathematicians, somehow it goes in the name of other mathematicians and very, really, very, very bad. So we must know that this equation was discovered by Brahmagupta and it's the God Brahmagupta equation. But here I must tell you something more, namely, when all these, came, these things came to light uh, in front of our Indian mathematicians, who are actually the uh, math sound mathematicians working nowadays, uh, at, for example, working at Tata Institute, at ISI and other research institutes. So they became interested in uh, finding out what was originally done by Indian mathematicians. And uh, uh, because that was in Sanskrit, so nobody knew outside. So they started, they, because they themselves knew Sanskrit. I must name, give name, some names here who are really working on the uh, history of Indian, ancient Indian mathematicians. Uh, you might be knowing one was Professor C. S. Shishadri, FRS. The other is uh, uh, Siritharan. He is also working on the history of Hindu mathematics. Then S. G. Dani is working on this. And uh, actually, even a, they organized a seminar. Sisadri organized a seminar in his institute, and he invited a field medalist who was also interested in Indian mathematics. His name was David Mumford. So he also came and participated in that seminar. And uh, all their seminars uh, have been published in a book and you can find that it actually it is, it is studies in the history of uh, mathematics, history of Indian mathematics. You can see their seminars and all of them really work very hard to find out exactly what Indian mathematicians had done in Sanskrit. They have worked it out now and they have translated in English and now the whole world is recognizing all these things. So this is what I want to say that even our Indian mathematicians like FRS and even field specialists, they are now digging the work of uh, Indian mathematicians done long time back and we are putting before the whole world and they are recognizing. So now most people uh, say that this Pell's equation is not Pell's equation, it's really Brahmagupta equation. Now in Sutras we have already seen the construction of right angle triangles having rational sides, but this Brahmagupta, he, uh, he, he was still interested in constructing figures with rational sides. And this is actually a great problem and this problem is nowadays, uh, it is attributed to Euler that he started this problem. But actually, Brahmagupta had already started this problem and he had worked on this. In the work of Brahmagupta reached Europe only in 19th century and is related to the existence of rational points on certain elliptic curves. Elliptic curves, this is a very famous branch of mathematics nowadays being pursued by great mathematicians. And you can see that Brahmagupta already had contributed something about elliptic curves. Then the third mathematician is the most important mathematician is Bhaskara Chat. As a, by the way, please let me know how much time I So I want to tell you about Brahmagupta. Uh, he is another mathematician. And as you know, Lilavati was one of the books that he has written. He not only written Lilavati, he has written several books. And there are books like uh, Lilavati, then Bij Ganit, then uh, uh, Grah and Goladhyay, Celestial Sphere. He wrote all his books but he was the last mathematician in that. The book is an excellent collection of everything known at that time, and the book is very systematic and as well as very lucid. And again, he used the method of Kuttak in solving the uh, interesting problems in arithmetic, geometry, quadratic equations, permutations, and combinations. He used the Kuttak method. Sir. In sir. 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 Yes, please sir, tell you, me. Sir, you can take five more minutes, sir. Okay, all right. Okay, I will thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. So, uh, I wanted to say yes. In Bees Ganit, there are problems which reduce to solving quadratic equation and sometimes even to cubic and biquadratic. And uh, Bhaskara Charles solved all these problems. 
Bhaskarachar was familiar with the uh, notion of the integration also as a limit of finite self. For example, he calculated the surface of the sphere, round sphere, by dividing it into small annuli and drawing a system of parallel circuits. And then he found out the formula that if you have a sphere of any sort, the surface is 4 pi r square. He also had the idea of differentiation in connection with the instantaneous velocity of planets. These are actually true things, and they are now being dug out what he had done, and they are being recognized. He also knew the formula, addition formula for sine and cosine, and especially in the sine functions. His infinitesimal um, approach probably found its full meaning in the mathematics of Kerala region, um, medieval, medieval period, like uh, which is called as Madhav School of Mathematics. So this is the last thing I want to do. I want to tell you that most of you may be knowing that calculus was discovered by either Leibniz or Newton. That is what the feeling we have, and that is what we have been taught. But actually, I must tell you that the things are uh, different now. It is not the Leibniz and the, uh, Einstein and, and the Newton who discovered calculus. The calculus was already discovered by Madhav School, mathematicians working in Madhav School of Mathematics in Kerala. And uh, uh, people actually thought that Bhaskarachar was the last mathematician in 12th century, but that was not true. After him, India was invaded by Muslims and Mughals, and, create, and the creative ideas did not come from Hindus, and uh, Britishers came to India. But actually, there was, there was already a school working in the uh, South India, uh, particularly in Kerala. And uh, this was all discovered by a person whose name is Charles Wish. And uh, he was actually an employee of East India Company. And in 1835, he discovered the works of Madhav School of Mathematicians. And he found really that Madhav School of Mathematicians was full of great scholars like Nilkant Sumayaji. And he worked in astronomy. And he also wrote a book called the Nyukti Bhasha, which was written by Jesh Deva in Malayalam, which had most of the works known by that time. This book contains works of mathematics and mathematical material on arithmetic fractions, Kuttak, and proof of the Pythagoras theorem, all these things. And there is one thing more called the Gregory series. And uh, this is the Gregory series now, nowadays known. The value of pi by 4 is 1 minus 1 third plus 1 fifth minus and so on. This series was really discovered by South Indians, by the uh, people working in uh, Kerala under Madhav School of Mathematics. But somehow it is known as Vigari series, like these Vigari series. Again, this is a misnomer. It is not, uh, it was already discovered by Indian mathematicians, mathematicians working in Madhav School of Mathematics. But somehow it is known as the Vigari series. So even the value of pi by 4, as you can see, the value of pi can be approximated by this. So this was done all by Indian mathematicians, and the Kerala School of Mathematicians is very famous now. And uh, now the history is being rewritten. Many people are actually working on Kerala School of Mathematics. Now researches are being done. So I would like to stop here because the time is not there. But the main crux of my lecture is that all these mathematicians whom I have mentioned, they have really consulted the book written by A.M. Singh and Dutta. And uh, they regard this book as really the source book for in the contributions of Indian mathematics and astronomy. And uh, people are now taking a lot of interest, good people, good mathematicians are taking interest. So I hope that the contributions of Indians will be known to the outside world in due course of time with proof. Thank so thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. I stop my lecture here. Thank you, thank Professor Satyadeo, uh, for uh, your uh, valuable thoughts and uh, va valuable things which you have told about uh, our ancient uh, mathematics. And uh, we were hearing it, uh, and we found that there are many uh, formulas and there are many uh, concepts which has been now named by some other uh, means uh, foreign professors or foreign uh, mathematicians. But uh, really, they were invented by our math mathematicians, Indian mathematicians. So we will keep on uh, doing uh, presentation on uh, these types of topics and in this uh, change uh, 
I just uh, wish to tell all of you present here and those who have joined that uh, tomorrow we are having a symposium on Vedic mathematics. And I hope there we will be having um, a session where we can get uh, our uh, some queries that uh, who invented zero exactly. Sometimes uh, or there are many other questions and queries are coming in. So I um, uh, again thanks uh, a lot for your nice presentation, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. So now our next speaker is. Uh, now we are uh, coming in offline mode and our next speaker is uh, very respected professor uh, manjul ma'am uh, i just want uh, if she can come here and she will speak about so i'm leaving okay thank you I'm thank you leaving, uh, thank you sir yes First talk you have the first Vedic mathematics thing, right? Waiting. Setting say me. Setting says I need to pull
नहीं नहीं पेड नहीं होता ये एक्चुअली पैसा पहले पेड था उसके बाद रिन्यूअल करने के लिए पैसा पेड ही नहीं था उसको मेल भी पड़ी वो बाद में था जिसके पास राइट्स थे उसको बताना चाहिए कम नहीं कर सकते नहीं मैम आप उसी दिन स्टार्ट करिए नहीं हो रहा है रिकॉर्डिंग इन प्रोग्रेस ये यूएसबी आया मैं देखता हूँ एक मिनट रुकिए आगे दोनों से कौन सा है किया हुआ हाँ तो तभी तो आ रहा है फिर किया ये देखिए जा रहा है भाई स्क्रीन सेव किया तो भाई जूम पे आने दीजिए स्टॉप शेयर हो रहा है स्क्रीन शेयर हो रहा है ना इसको नहीं इसको नहीं भैया इसको करिए ना इस इस ये इस हाँ बीच में ये इस हाँ यहाँ आया आया ठीक है ठीक है देखो स्क्रीन इस शेयरिंग क्या तो रहा न्यू शेयर कह रहा है स्क्रीन इस ऑलरेडी शेयरिंग ये देखिए ठीक है वो तो हम कहीं रहे इसको बड़ा कर दें I welcome uh, Professor Manjul Ma'am again. So sorry for keeping her wait for this uh, kind of trouble. So okay. So now we are going to listen her lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, in fact, 
asked to present something. And uh, I was requested, in fact, I was asked by Professor Pankaj Mathur that they could not listen to this lecture when I had spoken about it in Lucknow University. So th I thought, okay, anyway, I have PPT prepared for this, so I will continue with this. As such, it is also in the mood of you know, this conference, because first lecture was uh, by Professor Satyadev Tirupati. That was also on Hindu mathematics, and then he really enlightened us with the progress our ancient mathematicians were doing made that time. Now, Vedic mathematics, this is the topic which I have chosen. And uh, now let's start. The lecture is to... This is okay now? Are, am I audible? So the lecture is uh, devoted to our ancient mathematics, which is known as Vedic mathematics, and is becoming popular in school education all over the world. So what is what is Vedic mathematics? Is Vedic mathematics is the name given to the ancient system of mathematics, which was dis which is discovered from the Vedas. Uh, it's a unique technique of calculations based on simple principles and rules, with which any mathematical problem, be it arithmetic, algebra, or geometry, or trigonometry, can be solved. The motivation of learning a subject determines to a great extent the degree and intensity with which it is learned and utilized in later life. For instance, if one learns mathematics just because it is a compulsory part of the curriculum, one is likely to forget most of it as soon as the exam is over and will not use it in later life. However, if one learns mathematics because it is both fascinating and useful, and it is a great heritage of mankind, one is likely to retain its knowledge much longer. Mathematics is one of the greatest intellectual adventures of the man mankind. It has challenges for both novice and expert. Motivation for the study of mathematics we are continuing. On the other hand, scientists and engineers find mathematics extremely useful and fascinating because it enables them to get insight into physical biological, social, medical, and technological situations, which without mathematics, they would have never got it. One can learn mathematics in the same spirit as one learns painting or music, or in which one climbs mountains and goes to outer space, or one can learn it in the spirit of the scientists and the engineers to have a powerful tool in the study of nature and society. I hope you understand what I am I mean. One can learn a subject by hearing about it, by reading about it, by doing it, and by using it. It's only at the last stage of using it when one begins to get a significant insight into the subject. Thus, what is used leaves a deep impression on the mind as is not likely to be easily forgotten. Mathematics is relatively, relatively an abstract subject, and it deals with abstract concepts. How are applications make it concrete and easier to understand? Few can understand abstract structures unless these are profusely used and illustrated in concrete situations. Mathematics has a large variety of applications, and some of these must be known to you. One great application of mathematics is training in systematic and logical thinking, and this goal should always be kept in mind. The analogy with the conquest of space is particularly appropriate. Man started exploring outer space for the sake of meeting a great challenge and for getting additional knowledge. However, he has got rich dividends in terms of satellite communications, better weather predictions, and better knowledge about Earth's resources. Similarly, when he starts to study mathematics for its beauty and elegance and gets rich dividends in terms of 
tremendous applications to science and technology. The historical development of mathematics in India is old, as old as the civilization of its people. Indeed, history of mathematics is the common heritage of mankind, irrespective of any particular nation, race, or country. However, mathematics being the mirror of civilization, its development from prehistoric time has been affected by place, time, and sociological requirements. Accordingly, we have prehistoric mathematics, time before the invention of writing system, stone age, etc. Sumerian mathematics, I mean now this is the various types of mathematics where it was developed. Sumerian mathematics, 2000 to 1500 BC, Babylonian, 3000 BC, Egyptian mathematics 2000 to 1800 BC, Greek mathematics 700 to 450, Roman mathematics middle of the first century, Mayan mathematics 250 to 900 C, uh, C means common, current era, Chinese mathematics 200, uh, 2000 BC, Indian mathematics sutras from early Vedic period, that is 1000 BC, Islamic mathematics 19th to 15th century, medieval European mathematics 12th to 15th century, and then came the period of 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th century. I won't go into the details of evaluation of mathematics as many articles and books are available on this topic. Besides many societies like Indian Society of History of Mathematics, the British Society of History of Mathematics, Canadian Society of the History and Philosophy of Mathematics, International Commission of the History of Mathematics have been formed in order to promote this area and are holding conferences all over the world. Vedic math mathematics, as I said, deals mainly with various Vedic mathematical formula, which we call sutras, and their applications for getting out tedious and cumbersome arithmetical operations. Uh, to, yes, mm -hmm. uh, huh. Formula Sutras and their applications for carrying out tedious and cumbersome arithmetical operations, and to a very large extent, executing them mentally. The mathematicians, uh, mathematics sutras hold the power to speed up your calculation, give your confidence, and make our mathematics fun and interesting. The sutras are original thoughts or spoken or written in a concrete, concise, and memorable form and come from our early civilization. Indeed, our sages passed on their in, uh, collected work orally from one generation to other generation uh, using codes, which unlock various layers of meaning. This system was lost to the world until it was discovered by a scholar, Swami Tirthaji. There are 16 sutras and sub, uh, 13 sub sutras discovered by Swami Tirthaji, which deal with basic arithmetic operation, decimal fraction, convergence, etc. The purpose of these sutras is to evolve a met method which makes calculation easy and short. In case one sutra doesn't help, other one is used. For instance, nikilam does not help when divisors are small digit numbers. Then sutras like parvartya, Yojayat, mother transpose and adjust uh, the Vanjika flag method may apply. Next. Okay. These are the 16 sutras of Vedic mathematics and uh, rest sub sutras. Uh, left hand side. These are the sutras on the right hand side, sub sutras or corollaries you can call. And uh, you can read it. Ekadekin, Purvin, I mean, Anurepin. Yes, you can read it because it's in Sanskrit and uh, Purnavyas. Then, Chalan Kalan Vyas. So many sutras 16 sub sutras and 13 sub sutras. Now, I will take up one or two sutras. How do we apply? Like, uh, let us now consider three sutras with their applications. I will take Niklam Namaskarman Tasaj, all from nine and the last from 10. Actually, the base 10 plays a very important role. That's what 10, powers of 10, etc. as mentioned by uh, Professor Satyadev Tirfati. If you write, have to write 
160 to 100 plus 60 plus 2. So that is the importance of our base has been in our ancient mathematics uh, has been 10 or powers of 10. So when we for applying sutra, powers of 10 are taken as base. Let us apply the sutra to multiplication and division. Now I will take up this uh, multiplication. Let us multiply 997 by 985 and 115 by 107 respectively. The nearest base for 997 is 100,000, and uh, uh, whereas for two it is 100. See, for 997 into nine. To in 985, nearest base is 1,000, 10 raised to the power 3, and here it is 100 for the second problem. Now what you do from these numbers, it's like 1,000 is the base, you subtract 1,000 from 997, you will get minus 3, okay? And if you subtract 985 from, uh, 1,000 from 985, what will you be getting? Minus, minus 15. So what do you do, 997, then what you had got, uh, minus three as the uh, difference between 1,000 and 997. So if you add these two, what will you be getting? 994. Similarly, if you take 985, uh, see, uh, uh, this is cross, I think I, I have not. Uh, maybe it's in board, right? Can board can I can write on the See, I think. Oh. Oh, yeah, hey, hey, it's okay, it's there. See, if you, I have written this 1,000, and I have written below 1,000, 997 and 985. Okay, so now if I subtract 1,000 from 997, you get minus three, which I have written on the right side of the vertical line. Now, if you subtract 1,000 from 985, which is minus 15. Now, what do you do? You cross at 982 minus three, what do you get? Uh, sorry, 985 nine, nine, minus 3 is 982, which is written below. 997 nine, minus 15, which is again 982. So if you cross add these numbers, you are getting 982, which is written below the, uh, these two numbers, 997 nine, nine, and 985. Nine, now, then what you do? You multiply 15 and 3, you are getting 45 plus 45. And now since the base is 1,000, three digits have to be there. So put one zero before 45. So multiplication is 9282045. See, so multiplication of 997 and 985 is 982045. It's so simple, right? Now, second example which I have taken is uh, 115 into 107. Now, if you subtract 100 from 115, you are getting 15. 107 from 107, now one, and then if you cross head, you are getting 122, right? And then if you uh, multiply this, if you multiply seven, you are getting 35, and seven into one is seven. If you add three, you will be getting 10. So you are writing zero here, one you are carrying on the left-hand side. So the total is 123, and the whole multiplication is 123.05. That's what it is. So depending on the base, how many zeros are there, we have, in case of 1,000, we have put one zero here on the left of 45 because there were two digits. In the case of 100, since we already have two digits, zero, 05, and then one is carrying over, we are carrying in the left-hand side, you get the multiplication, one, two, three, zero, 05. So that is what it is. Similarly, you can take some other examples. If, say, with numbers which are not very close to uh, 100 or base numbers, for example, if you multiply uh, 18 into 17, uh, this, in case both the multiplicand are not near to a convenient base, we apply the subsutra, subformula, anurupen, which means proportionality. For examples, examples 3 and 4, our bases are 10 into 5, see, 48 into 47, if you consider, then your base, you are taking 10 into 5, which is 50. If you write 50 on the top, and then you subtract 50 from 48, you are getting minus 2. Uh, 47, you are getting minus 3. And then what you do? You add, cross, add, you are getting 15. 
18 minus 3 is 15, 17 minus 2 is 15. If you multiply this, you are getting 6. And then what is what you had done? You had multiplied 10 by with 5. So you multiply this number by 5, 15 with 5. You will be getting 2 to 5, and then right hand side 6. So your multiplication of these two numbers, 48 and 47, is 2 to 5, 6. Similarly, if you divide here. Uh, your other set is 249, 245, which is very close to 250. You divide 1,000 by 4, which is base becomes 250. And then accordingly, you subtract minus 1, minus 5. And then you uh, here, by cross-adding, you get 214. And since multiplication gives you 5, base is 1,000, so 005. And then if you divide by 4, 61 you are getting and 005 so you get this so i mean it makes life easy if you want to divide similarly you can do using the base uh, like 115 by 58 if you want to divide so if you 100 you are taking as a base 58 because 115 is close to 100 so you are dividing uh, 115 by 58 what do you do? 115 since it's a two-digit number. So I will separate one from that will be the quotient. And then you subtract 58 uh, from 100, you are getting 42. And then 1 by 15, you are quotient there. And then 42 into 1, you are getting 42. So you are getting the division as 1 by 57 is a fraction. And 1, of course, is there. What is the? Quotient. Similarly, 9819, if you divide by this, uh, uh, huh, here dividend, divisor is 9819 and dividend is 20137. 9819 is close to uh, 10,000 and then here it is a five digit number, so you, four digit is, is the divisor, so you separate divisor, 2 is the quotient, and then you, uh, since 2 is the quotient, multiply quotient with 0, 1, 8, 1, you get 2, 16 you are getting, so I will put the ones down, then 2 into 1, and then 0. So 2 by 0, 4, 9, 9, because 1 will be added to 3. So like that, uh, 1 will be added to 2, because it's coming here. So it's 2 by 0, 4, 4, 9, 2 is the quotient. So that way you are uh, getting these things. Now next uh, is vertically and crossword. Urdhva, Tiriya, Bhyam. Okay. Let us, now I will use this for the multiplication. Here, of course, I think I have, it's not there mentioned. But what, you have to multiply 98 by 47. Here, see, the digits are, one digit is close to 100, other one is close to 50. So what ways should we take? So in this case, we use this method. So here, what we do, uh, we write 9, 8, and 4, 7, like this. And then for multiplying this, what you do? You multiply 8 and 7, you are getting 56. 6, you write just below 8, 7 column. Then you multiply 9 and 5, you just take to the other digit below. And then you take other uh, step is cross, multiply cross, 9 into 7 plus 8 into 4, 95. You fight by this uh, right 5 uh, by the, of 95 by the side of uh, 6 here. And then multiply uh, the last column, 9 into 4, 36. So now what, actually here it's not written. Uh, I can say, then if you multiply six, you are writing, then five from the text, and then 36. And below you will be writing, below this, uh, uh, 56 in the column of eight and six, five of 95 in the column of nine and four, and 36 preceding 56, as such, below the horizontal dark line. And you carry five of 56 to the column of nine and four, and six, uh, then uh, nine and four, and nine of nine below six of 36. In the next line I've shown below, actually it's uh, not there in the, 
you will be adding and the, you will be getting the product as 4606. Maybe I think next example I take there, I have written. Like, if you take three digit number, you have to multiply 362 into 134. So what you will do, 362 you write on the top, 134 below, then you multiply two into four, and then first on the extreme right, you multiply, then crosswise, then all three, cross and vertical, and then cross. So that way and vertical. Blackboard was at the Mesco from Jasaki. Pointer, hey, pointer. Pointer, zero. But it's easy, very easy, in fact. Mm -hmm. And next one would be much better, I suppose. That's, of course, easy. Full hai. Oh, so bind up two into four, eight. Then cross multiplication, first two. Six into four, two into three, thirty. And then this multiplication, vertical and cross you are getting 32. And then this multiplication, 3 into 3 and 6 into 3 into 1, you will be getting all these. How will you write this? See, I have written 3, 6, 2. We have to multiply these two digits. 2 into 4, 8. Then 0 from the other one, 0 from there. Then 2 from 32. And then 5 from 15 and then three from here, the vertical line. And then we are carrying over one third, three, three, and you have to get this. So that way you can go. Next slide. Similarly, you can multiply four digits, a number like this, one, 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 two, one, and using this figure, right, then first two cross, first three cross and vertical, all cross, and then these cross, and cross, and then last vertical. And then you can write the multiplication 1, 2, 6, 8, 9, 7, 2. This is just for simple thing. You can do it. Next. Now, let us apply this sutta. Ika dekana. Are you going to So, let us apply this sutra to convert the vulgar fraction into their equivalent decimal form. Let's consider this fraction, say, 1 by 19, whose denominator ends with 9. In this sutra, the proposition is by means that either you can use multiplication or division. Accordingly, we consider the first method as method of multiplication. <coughs> the last digit of the denominator is 9, and the previous one is 1. And so one more than the previous one evidently means 2. 1 plus 1, 2, 19. And the rule here stipulates that the product of the last digit of the denominator, the last digit of the decimal equivalent must invariably be nine. This last digit must be nine in multiplication. And so we start with one as the right hand most digit. See, it's a rational number, Salopna, and uh, it is going to repeat. Decimal expansions are going to repeat. So now our two is this, one I am writing this, two into one, two, two into two, four, 2 into 4 is 8, 2 into 8 is 16, so 1 I have written here. Then 2 into 6 is 12, plus 1, 13. 1 is being carried over here. 2 into 3 is 6, plus 1, 7. 2 into 7 is 14, 1. And 2 into 4 is 8, 9. Now, actually, this is half of the digits you have got, 9. And now, 2 into 9 is 18, 1 and so on. You are just multiplying two, and whatever is being uh, on the, if it is a double digit number, you put it here, and then, of course, you complete it, 
as long when you get zero because after this this will be repeated okay next uh, for multiplication see for multiplication we started from the right for division next slide next slide uh, uh, for division i mean this is i the details i have written i mean multiply 6 by 2 and so on and then we follow this process continuously until we reach the 18 digits uh, counting left uh, words from the right uh, next digit please now if we use the method of division we will be starting from here right uh, modus operandi is dividing 1 by 2 you get 0 and then 1 is the remainder 1 into 10 5 5 and now uh, if you divide 5 by 2 you get 2 divided, 5 divided by 2 is 2, 1 is the remainder, so you will be getting 12, 12 you divide by 6, 6 if you divide by 2, 3, if you divide 3 by 1, 1 is the remainder, then 11, 2, if you divide 11 by 2, 5, the quotient and 1 is the remainder, and so on. If you divide 15 by 2, you get 7, 1 is the remainder. If you divide 17 by 2, you get Quotient as 8, 1 is the remainder. 18, again 9, and then again you go on like this. If you divide 9 by 2, you get 4, 1 is the remainder, and so on. So this is the division of 1 by 19 by using that formula. Have one thing you which I would like to say. See, this is we have got. And if you, 9 digits of this on the right and left, if you add, you will be getting 999999. So if you get half of the digits, you can get the remaining half by subtracting from 99999. And this way, you can have. Next digit. So what actually this, uh, these formula do? It helps a person to solve problems 10, 15 times faster. See, 1 by 19, you can immediately find the fraction. I mean, decimal expansion. It reduces burden. Uh, in the sense that you need to learn tables up to nine only, not beyond nine. And then it provides one line answer. It's a magical tool to reduce scratch work and finger counting, Incre increases concentration. Type same can be used to answer more questions and a logical thinking process gets enhanced. I think that's all. Next. Thank you. Next slide is, uh, these are some references which I had. We do so, especially Swami Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mayor. It was really very interesting talk given by you. And sorry, we kept you waiting here. That was some unexpected thing happened. Thank you, Mayor. First thing to happen in conferences. Okay. Nothing not to This way you can. We have only five minutes uh, for this meeting, but we will restart this meeting. So there may be some uh, slight changes in the uh, sequence. So first of all, uh, I just need to uh, tell you that uh, uh, there is a special guest here with us, Professor S. Ahmad Ali. He has joined some uh, m minutes before. He is Dean and Professor of School of Basic Sciences, Babu Banarsidas University, and life member of BGP also, and very good friend of us. So we welcome you, sir. I'm just waiting so that we can start with new ma meeting. So, and also we have to just check with the person who is uh, here in the line. So just please bear with us. Thank you.
and present the memento to Manjul ma'am. Please clapping. Thank you, ma'am. We are really blessed. Very shortly, we are going to connect with the, uh, our next speaker. Recording in progress. His professor, Om Desmukh, his director, Data Sciences, InvestNet, Udli, Bangalore, and he is presenting a paper the joint paper with the Professor Pramod Kumar Singh, uh, he's in US, and Professor Om Deshmukh is there in Bangalore. He has already joined. So very shortly, we are going to listen to his lecture. Uh, hello, everybody. Can you, can you all hear me? Sir, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay. Professor I, Pankaj I Jain is here. Share the screen. Um, first of all, namaskar to everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me and uh, uh, Pramod Singh for, for this session. Uh, very, very honored to be here. Uh, I have a small logistics question before I can start. How do I share my screen? It says the host has disabled participants from sharing their screens. A survey. Right. That's why I was telling them. Professor Deshmukh? Yes, I'm able to share. Yes. Uh -huh. let, me, let me share. Yeah. Uh, can you all see the screen? Yeah. Okay, I think I take that as a yes. If you are able to see the uh, Yes, thank you, sir. Slide where. Uh, sorry to uh, sorry to interrupt you, Professor Deshmukh. Can I ask one question uh, from the organizers? If you uh, allow sure, me. sir. Ha, ha, yes, sir. Please. First of all, yeah. I am not a professor. I am. Uh, <laughs> I am. I am not in the academia. Uh, so uh, no, no, call no, me no. Om. <laughs> uh, no, uh, it's very nice of you, uh, Omji. Uh, organizers say uh, I have a small question. Is there any change in the schedule? Because after uh, Professor Manjul Gupta, it was supposed to be my talk. So I don't know if there was any change in the schedule. Uh, sorry, sir. Uh, sorry for this uh, small change. Uh, Professor Pankaj Jain, uh, I am extremely sorry uh, from the side uh, of organizers. Uh, so uh, now both of you are uh, our very respected and invited guests. So uh, I can say whichever uh, ready to present first and whichever uh, can give opportunity to other that is uh, in between you people. So, because uh, I cannot no, say no, no to anyone. No, for, me, for me, it's okay. But I just wanted to make sure that uh, there was no change from the organizer's side. No, uh, yes, uh, uh, Professor Pankaj, actually, uh, there was a change, I told, but uh, uh, it could not be communicated uh, that uh, uh, actually uh, Professor Desmukh has to leave uh, before 2.30, that was the message came from, and from our side, it happened that uh, the meeting has been lagging and uh, it, uh, it has gone a little bit uh, forward. That's why uh, this thing is happening, what I can say uh, that uh, uh, we are extremely sorry. So um, uh, I again say that uh, whosoever uh, is ready to speak. So 
No, no, for me, it's okay. Uh, let's uh, Mr. Wong go on. Then after uh, him, I will uh, share my uh, talk. Yes, Professor uh, Pankajan, it's uh, really uh, a great uh, um, thing that uh, you are accepting this request. A lot of thanks, and sorry for this inconvenience yeah, sure, again. Sure, sure. Sorry, sir. Yeah. Sure, please. So, yeah, sure, please. Oh. Go on. Yeah. Okay, so now uh, we are continuing with uh, Professor Deshmukh's talk. So here is Professor Deshmukh. We will not take much time off. Okay, sir. Okay. So... Uh, so thank you so much, uh, all the organizers, for for having Promo and me in this, uh, you know, in this session. Uh, at the outset, I'm I'm not a mathematician at all by any stretch of imagination. Uh, what I am is a a machine learning person who, you know, who uses quite a lot of uh, fundamental maths in in all of the data sciences work that we do. And so what Promo and I thought we can do is share a little bit about, you know, what is the what is the uh, the value that maths brings to today's data science and machine learning, and largely talk about our experience in terms of what we have seen, uh, you know, what is happening in the industry today. Yeah, and, and I believe I have 15 minutes, so I'm going to you know zip through some of these. I will share the the presentation with the organizers if anybody wants to look at it later uh, or wants to connect with me uh, or promote uh, post the talk. So a fundamental problem that we see in, you know, in machine learning as a whole is that when we as humans communicate, we always talk in a very qualitative way, right? So for example, somebody asks you how the movie was, uh, you will use a lot of positive or negative adjectives, how your Diwali or vacation was, how is the new product that you bought and so on. On the other hand, when you're looking at machines, the most, uh, the most important thing that any machine has to do when it is making a data-driven prediction is it has to translate all of these qualitative, you know, positive, negative connotations into quantitative things. For example, the product rating is 3.8 out of 5, or that these 10 options have to be ranked in this particular order and so on, which means there is no ambiguity at all. A 2 is a 2 everywhere. Uh, whereas what is good uh, cannot be quantified, right? So that's a big difference, and that's one place where fundamentally uh, we see that the the math principles that have been existing for many years and being researched upon uh, come into come into play. And the reason I want to talk about this is if there are students or you know junior faculty members who are trying to get into uh, you know applied math in terms of machine learning or data science. Uh, you know, know that there is a lot of value in terms of what you have learned from your mathematics background uh, and so on. So this is one problem. And I'll tell you a little bit about how, uh, you know, how we are trying to solve these problems. Uh, and in this, any machine learning uh, problem, the first thing we have to do is get some human labels that will help your machines to learn what, what are the n number of classes that need to be distinguished and what are the characteristics that will distinguish one class from the other. So what I'm giving you here is an example, a very simple example of distinguishing the red color from the green color. So think of it as some sort of a image processing or a computer vision problem. Now what happens is, for a machine to be trained, you will need lots and lots of labels from the humans that say that the top color is the red color, the bottom one is the green, and so on. And typically, if the problem is this simple, all the human labels will be 100% consistent. Unless, of course, the human has, you know, is not able to look at it colorly or has uh, correctly or has, uh, um, you know, any sort of a uh, color blindness. Barring those cases, the human uh, labels will be extremely accurate for a problem that is as simple as this. But in real world, what happens is you will have a very complex kind of a problem, which is what I'm showing you here, where now the humans will be asked to label, let us say, what is a navy blue color versus what's a dark blue color or what's dark yellow light yellow versus orange yellow and so on and then as you bring in these kind of subjectivities or nuances in creating the data that will be used for uh, for training the machines 
the human labels itself will be quite subjective. And so in some sense, the bar that will be that will be sort of the ceiling for machine performance will be the consistency or the accuracy that you have across humans. And so one, you know, one setup that we use very consistently uh, in, in terms of discarding or accepting a human label is what is called as the significance tests. And this has evolved over a, over a long period of time into what we now call as uh, the RNR tests, the repeatability and reproducibility tests. Again, the statistical significance test, I'm sure everybody is aware of, you know, one-sided or two-sided and so on. And so we use a combination of that with, uh, with repeatability and reproducibility to, to figure out which human inputs to be used or not. Unfortunately, in, in today's day and age, uh, with so much hype around machine learning, these fundamentals get, you know, get sort of uh, brushed under the carpet and I wanted to highlight this. Is there a question? I guess not. Okay. Um, right. Then the next part is when we are training a, uh, a machine learning algorithm, the one of the fundamental components is what is the cost function that you're going to use. And that cost function has a very direct bearing on what the optimal, uh, you know, what is the optimal model that will be learned. So to give you a couple of examples, what I'm showing you here are uh, on the x-axis is let us say the input or the output of your model and on the y-axis is the cost function or the or the penalty that you would associate for a, a mistake right and so the leftmost where my mouse pointer is is a linear function what that means is if you make a small mistake in your prediction versus the the actual output then the uh, the cost will grow linear. Small difference will lead to small cost. A higher uh, difference will lead to a higher cost. So that's your linear function, right? On in the middle, you have a stepwise linear function. Essentially, what this said is, if the difference is anywhere between this point to this point, I'm hoping you are able to look at to, to see my uh, mouse pointer. Any difference that is within a range will not lead to a big change uh, or any change at all in the cost penalty. On the other hand, in the extreme right figure, what I'm showing is basically a mixed or a stepwise mixed function for cost penalty. What this says is that any difference between your predicted output and the output uh, and the actual output, which is within a certain range, has no problems, has no penalty at all which means your models are able to learn tolerance as long as that tolerance is within a particular threshold. Now, the reason this, you know, this kind of uh, uh, difference in the cost functions become important is a lot of the times you will have rounding off errors. A lot of the times you will have genuine confusions between two human experts who are looking at a particular problem. For example, you know, Professor Jain uh, or, and Professor Singh, if both of them are evaluating the same paper, and if one of them says 42 is good enough to be passed, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the other professor says no, 45 is good enough to be passed, rather than distinguishing between 42 and 45, uh, which is what would happen if you had a linear cost function, a mixed cost function will say anything that is, you know, plus minus three of two experts is, is okay to be accepted. People who are not talking, can you please uh, go on mute? It may be a distraction. Okay. Thank you. Uh, or the organizers can mute everybody else, uh, if that's possible. I think that will be a help if organizer can mute all in the audience. Please. Yeah, see this person, whoever it is, probably doesn't know that their, that their phone is unmuted. Oh, actually, I yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know. Yeah. Oops. Okay. Are you all sir, still here? Sir, you have control in your hand. You can mute everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, just, I think I just muted this person who, who probably inadvertently <laughs> switched their, <laughs> switched their okay. speaker. Okay, sir. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so, yeah. So, this is, again, the, the point I wanted to make here is for practitioners, 
who are you know getting out of uh, fundamental maths into applied maths or trying to get into data science and and those fields that the fundamentals that you learn in terms of cost functions and and basics of maths do not discard them definitely go back and, and you know use them there's a lot of practical value to it i have seen umpteen cases where the cost function was used uh, incorrect cost function was used and the blame was landed on the model whereas obviously the model is you know is learning based on the cost function that uh, that was given here okay so that's one uh, the other point is the uh, data normalization and and so what i'm showing you here are four samples the stars that you see are the uh, are the samples and now what happens in just about any practical uh, machine learning or data science problem is that your data is coming from different places right and so the dynamic range of your data or the uh, you know the 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 values that you think the data will have will always be very different from one source to the other for example totally making this example up but but hopefully you all can relate to it is of the dynamic range and, and so a lot of the times recording again, in progress okay um, a lot of the times again you know when people are not aware of of the changes in these dynamic ranges uh, the models will obviously break and so the first thing that that we have to do here is normalize the data appropriately uh, when i say appropriately it is what is based on uh, on what the data looks like and so in this example what i'm trying to show is that these two samples the, these two stars if you take a angular distance will fall exactly on the same point versus if you take these two points right and so in this simple case of four data data points if i use a angular distance for either doing a data normalization or clustering the output i will see is very different from the output i would have seen if i had used let's say a euclidean distance and again this is a very important problem as we prepare data for for any modeling uh, and so on okay uh, moving to the next I, I, again i'm sort of rushing through this i have a, uh, a commitment at 230 that i need to be out for um, okay so this is a uh, a class of problem that that i have been working on for past several years uh, on and off and, and the the problem is the following you know in today's day and age what happens is the data is not static at all the complexity of the data grows on a daily basis or every time you get a next batch of data and hence the models that you are training will have to change uh, will have to keep up with the complexity of of the data if you have a very complex model right in the beginning when your data is very small then that's an overkill it's a it's a waste of your precious resource compute computing and so on on the other hand if you do not have a complex enough model when your data is really diverse and and complex then what will happen is that the model will not be able to uh, grasp all the uh, all the various patterns that exist in the data and that's why there is you know, there has to be this um, fine balance between what we call as underfitting a model versus overfitting a model and, and to sort of you know relax that uh, that staticness of the uh, of the model there is there's a technique that i'm going to talk about in a minute uh, but i'm trying to motivate that by by showing you what happens as you as you let the complexity of the data grow over a period of time right so what you see here is that there are 11 samples again a 2d uh, very simplistic 2d Uh, 2d space and let us say we were to cluster these and assume that you know used any k means or or any clustering method and let's say you assume that the number of clusters is 2 very clearly you will see you see in this in this figure also that uh, for these 11 observations you do have two clusters right now let's say if you had fixed the number of clusters in let's say a k means kind of a cluster to be 2 and next day your observations grew to 23 then 
Now that same k equal to 2 based k means clustering will give you very different uh, results. On the other hand, what you really should have done is on the next day when you had 23 samples, you should have increased your k Excuse from me? 2 to 4. Excuse right? me? Um, uh, and that's, that's what I mean by increasing the complexity of the model as your data samples increase. On a third day, excuse when you me, Professor. Yet another, uh, you know, new Hello. samples. You want the, uh, you want the k, the number of clusters to grow um, automatically. So you want to have that scalability in your, in your system. Today, when you, excuse me, Prof. Yes. Uh, can, can you wind up in two minutes, sir? Yes, yes. I am. I am winding up exactly two minutes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and so what we have to do uh, in such cases is we need a system that will allow for flexibility in the model uh, as well as let the model grow uh, with the complexity. And so, so again, one of the, the techniques that, uh, that we've been doing quite a bit of research on is what is called as Bayesian non-parametrics, which allows you to have some parameter. So it's not like there are no parameters at all. It's obviously grounded in the, the Bayesian way of thinking, um, which is all probabilistic has some parameters, but at the same time, it has hyper parameters, which let you control how the number of clusters in this particular case, how the number of clusters will, uh, will grow and so on. Uh, and so that's the other point I wanted to make, is that the value of, of knowing your maths very well as you get into machine learning comes in handy when you're looking at practical problems, like trying to solve uh, you know, uh, uh, dynamic complexity data models. Okay, so that's all I had. Uh, I I can stop here and take if there are any questions. If not, uh, you know, offline also I should be reachable uh, through the organizers. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Desmukh. Uh, okay. It was really an interesting talk. And, uh, I think uh, if uh, anybody have any questions uh, or queries, I have no question, but I have a small remark yeah. uh, that. Uh, uh, although uh, I have not uh, understood anything because I am not into computers, I am a mathematician, uh, but I can uh, say that your lecture was uh, very good, very uh, well organized, and uh, it was very thorough. And oh, the, topic which, uh, <clears throat> the topic which you chose, machine learning, is, the, is I think um, it is going to take the world completely because machine learning is the key nowadays. And sometimes I feel that uh, not only it is important, it is becoming dangerous also. Uh, you know, what happens is that uh, uh, because you are an expert, I am only uh, one of the users of uh, this machine. So what happens is that uh, if you talk to your family members about something, and next day, the same advertisement and those, they pop up in your mail and all that. So, I mean, this artificial intelligence and this machine learning will take us where, no idea. So it is becoming really very, very uh, dangerous. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yes, sir. It is, it is, uh, so, so, so your point is well taken, that there are, uh, that unless this technology, like any other technology, if, if it is not used the right way, can cause quite a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of yeah. uh, havocs in the society. And so there are a lot of, Indian government, by the way, is, is doing a great job, uh, especially the current, job, current government now with, you know, which is trying to keep up with the technology. Uh, they have come up with a lot of proposals in terms of data privacy and, and so on, you know, data sharing and things like that. Uh, worldwide also, there are quite a few organizations, not profit-driven profit -driven organizations, but not-for-profit organizations, which are trying to form these consortiums through, through which they can, they can be watchdogs or keep an eye on, on where the technology is getting used and so on. I, I work very closely with, uh, with several IITs. Uh, you know, I, have, I have some good relations with them where where we have students working with us, or you know, I sort of giving lectures and mentoring some of the students on their masters and PhD. Uh, if if, if there is interest, professor, and I say this very humbly, I would love to you know interact with with the academia because this is my topic. This is what I've done my PhD in, and I've worked in for many years. Uh, and I truly believe that a lot of the 
a lot of the policy decisions or how these kind of technologies will be used will will come from the academia uh, especially the, you know, the the esteemed audience that is that is here in this session professor jain uh, people like yourself um, so yes i think it's it will be a collective responsibility of all of us to yes of course of, of course of course of uh, course yeah 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 so uh, it was really very wonderful uh, listening to you it was a good lecture Thank you, thank you, uh, and again, thank you so much, organizers, for for giving me and promoting this opportunity. Sir, sir, Professor Deshmukh, I just need to take this opportunity to ask one question. Uh, although we are uh, having running short of time, as uh, Professor Pankaj already asked. Uh, or said that uh, this is becoming uh, something dangerous also. But I, I cannot say it is dangerous or uh, difficult. But the thing is, um, means, uh, I could not uh, mm, be very much attentive uh, throughout your uh, co uh, means presentation. Maybe I missed or you have already discussed. I have a small query. I think in the very beginning, you told about uh, how machine speaks or something. So I just need to know, is there any program or some, some kind of uh, devices or apps has been made that uh, means when computer speaks, it uh, speaks in a uh, different kind of uh, means uh, expressions like uh, anger or happiness or something. Means uh, the machine can interact like that also? Yeah, yeah. So, there, so, so by the way, just, I, I'll, I'll answer that question in, in two parts. The first part is I, I was using the machine speaks in a, in a figurative way, not literal. I was just saying that the machine will respond in a particular way. Uh, so that was my uh, figurative way of, of communicating that piece. But to your actual question, which is, are there systems which can uh, which can add emotions while they are speaking? Yes, absolutely, there is quite yes. a lot of work. Uh, in fact, my, my PhD was in uh, applications of machine learning for speech recognition. Uh, and then, you know, in my previous organizations, we had worked on uh, speech synthesis. That is, given a text, written text, can can we have machines that can speak it out? Uh, and then a lot of work in terms of bringing emotions. So if you see an exclamation in the text, change the way the, the sentence is spoken. If you see a question mark, uh, try and raise your uh, you know raise your pitch so it ends on a question. Acha ye pooch rahe ho, uh, you know that kind of thing. Good. Um, and so yes, there are there is a lot of work that is going on both in in the research side as well as on product side. Uh, no, I cannot name one app over the other, but today there are several apps both on Android as well as on Apple, uh, where you know which can take a text and provide emotion. Sometimes, if I have some queries, uh, uh, if I can disturb you people. <laughs> oh sure, sure. Again, thank you so much. Uh, okay. Thank you, Professor. Deshmukh, now we have... Leave. Will it end it for everybody? Can leave. Yes, you can leave, sir. So now our next speaker is Professor Pankaj Jain. Actually, Professor Pankaj Jain is waiting. He's al he is already there. And he's... Uh, yes, so okay, uh, I should share my screen. Uh, so it says that host disabled participant sharing screen. So if you please uh, authorize me to share my screen. Wait, wait a minute, sir. Uh, professor, uh, actually, uh, this uh, is showing that uh, the meeting will finish in 10 minutes, so why not we restart it? Okay. Okay, so we are just going to re okay. leave and then we'll restart it. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you.
host three is already host. Professor Jain. Yes, please. Yes, yes. You can start with your presentation, sir. No, but it says that it will end uh, in seven minutes. So are you going to end the meeting or should I end no, no, the meeting no, I have to, uh, and then rejoin? Okay. No, we have already started. No, but yes. I did not end from my side, so should I go on or Sir, sir you leave and rejoin the meeting because we have already started the okay, new meeting. Okay, okay. okay. Give, give me some seconds, I will go. Okay, sir. You can sit here or you can sit there. Don't worry. I will handle or otherwise I need your help. I will call you. I'm a lagger in Khadir or everybody. Better. You you take your seat. Huh? Bus member long or whatever. Recording in progress. Okay, so I have rejoined. So uh, yes, Professor Pankaj Jain is with us. I think he can start his presentation. Let me see. Uh, but again, uh, you have to allow me to share my screen. Yes. It yes, is sir. Disabled. Yeah. Now you are the host, sir. So, is my screen visible? Yes, very much. Is my screen visible and am I audible to all? Yes, 